utility. How do you bring the existential approach into this? Well, that's for instance an example. That's an example for it. And a very good one. Uh, what I understand is the main character of the existentialist attitude and the existentialist movement is to look at the human predicament. Man has a predicament. That means he is finite. He has to die. He has guilt feelings, even if he represses them. He has uh, a quest for a meaning of life, and if he cannot find an answer to it, he lives in a feeling of emptiness, which I noticed, by the way, especially strong in the students after the Second World War, uh, all around the country where I was teaching and discussing. And uh, he has a feeling of a loneliness which is not the great solitude which every human being should have quite frequently. But if he doesn't have it, then he falls into a state of painful loneliness. Now, all these things are described in the great works of existentialism. And although I am not a man of literature or of poetry or art anyhow, but a man of philosophy and theology, I would say the greatest expressions of what existentialism is, we should not look for amongst the philosophers, although they have conceptualized it, but we should look for in the novelists like Kafka, in the poets like Eliot and Orden, in the dramatists like uh, Tennessee Williams and Miller, and then even earlier in people like Dostoevsky, and very early, the first great existentialist work which impressed me as a young man, namely Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, which I think is perhaps still the greatest of all. Although it isn't generally considered as such. Unfortunately. <laughs> Yet, I'm concerned about several problems that come up here. If essentially man seeks meaning, he wants to abate the loneliness. The fact that something will do it for him psychologically, does this say anything about its meaningfulness in a reality? Now, everything which has the power to transform uh, has, by this very fact, the given the proof that it is real itself. Let me exemplify this in emotional appeals of so-called evangelists, who, by their emotional appeal, like the political agitators and propagandists produce for a certain moment emotions. And uh, compare this with a mature Christian or a mature humanist who uh, has been transformed by the humanistic tradition to a mature man in the, according to the ideal, for instance, of the stoic wise man. Here, some ideas and some images, especially images, have the power to transform him. And the same is with Christianity. There is no other real argument for the truth of a religion than the transforming power it has. And if a Christian says that this transforming power came to him from the image of Jesus, who was called the Christ uh, in the New Testament, then this shows the power of that event. Let me pull 
pose a hypothetical question, and if I may, suppose from an historical perspective there were reason this next week to doubt that historically a man Jesus called the Christ ever lived. To doubt that. Would this make a difference in terms of Christianity? Oh, no, by no means. I uh, express it even more radically by saying if the police files of Nazareth would be discovered under the sand of Palestine and one would find there is no man of this name in the police files of Nazareth, then it wouldn't make any difference because the person then would have had another name which impressed the man who impressed himself so on the disciples who are behind the New Testament that they called him the Christ. Then it wouldn't be Jesus the Christ, perhaps it would be Joshua the Christ or Jacob the Christ or any other name. But there must have been such a man historically? There is a historical event which has happened and which has happened in the inner center of a personality whose relationship to God was not broken by estrangement from God. That is the image we have. And somebody must have had power, which we don't find anywhere else in history, to impress himself so that this image of Jesus in the Gospels and in the letters of Paul especially comes out. That is my only argument I can have here, because I know, and we agree about this, I suppose, that no historical research ever can give religious certainty. In the Oriental religions, there isn't need for the historical event, is there, or no evidence of it particularly? Now, there, of course, is the same situation, uh, let's say, with Buddhism. Uh, the Buddha, whose name was Gautama, probably, as same way probably as the Christ's name probably was Jesus of Nazareth, this uh, event happened, has, it has transformed uh, a large part of mankind by the spiritual power of this man. It was not a new idea of Hinduism, a new sect in the many groups of Hinduism and their religion, but it was a personal power. Now it might interest you when I was in Japan and was discussing these problems with uh, the highest educated Buddhists, priests and philosophers, then they simply accepted the traditional Buddha image and didn't care very much for historical research. But since the Christian, especially the Protestant scientific research of the Gospels has become known to them, they have started also to make historical research for the real life of the men whose name was Gautama, and who was called the Illuminated, the Buddha, as Jesus was called the Christ. And uh, it's very interesting. I believe this is one of the ways in which our encounter with the foreign religions today leads to a kind of dialogue which is fruitful for both of them.